Lord a hand. Thank you, Thank you guys. Uh, Helena's worship. It's great to hear that we are a child of the King. Isaiah chapter 2 is what we're going to look at this morning. The prophet Isaiah visualizes a recreation of humanity in Isaiah chapter 2, and I want to read this passage to you. It says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountains of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into the plowshares and their spears into the pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Isaiah's picture here is very beautiful. It's probably one of my favorite passages in Scripture because the heart of Isaiah is longing for this great day where the world is redeemed and the world is redeemed through the people of God. Isaiah's words are like brush strokes that picture a real possible future for all of humanity. And in Isaiah's future scenario, God's word is established for all the nations. It says here, all people sing the praises of God. The nations are peaceful and war is obliterated. And this is the promise for the future. This slightly contrasts the events that we see in the world right now. In the world right now, we see war. We see starvation. We see famine. We see hostility. We don't see people beating their swords into the plowshare or into the ground. We see people studying war and fighting with one another. Presently, perhaps the majority of nations have implicitly or explicitly quieted the songs of God. And they have bound his word so that they long for the things that are not of the Lord. Even here in our own country, we see a world that has freedom that's tarnished with other things like class warfare, racial tension, economic struggles, the intolerance of religions, and of course the denial of the one true God. And if you pay close attention, uh, very uh, much, uh, or very close attention, the information is given here for what's going on in the book of Isaiah. And what you're going to see is that we as the people of God are the ones who are being called to respond to this vision. Now, you think, how does this vision of Isaiah actually happen? So you have the picture. Here's the prophecy. Here's what we want to see. We want to see a world that is filled with the blessings of God. We want to see a world that's filled with the purposes of God taking place. I mean, I don't think anyone here really wants a world filled with death or starvation or hunger or desolation or war or any of these type of things. We like the idea of peace and safety and security. But then the question arises in the book of Isaiah chapter 2 is how does that type of world come about? How does that type of world take place? And here, if you notice, it says that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established and the word of the Lord will go out from it. And they will say to the peoples of all the nations, come, let us bow down, let us worship the Lord. Now, sometimes in church history and in church life, we, I think, have misapplied this promise. Some people have read this promise and said to themselves, this is referring to the second coming of Jesus when Jesus will return and everything will be made new. Well, that's wonderful, but what that creates is a type of escape that says that our mission until Jesus returns is to hold on. It's not really to do a lot, but we're supposed to maintain. Instead of that, the early church, as well as most of church theologians throughout history, have believed that Isaiah chapter 2 pictured something different. It says that the mountain of the Lord, his house will be established, and all the nations will flood to it. It says the word of the Lord will go out from Jerusalem. Now, when in church life has the word of the Lord gone out from Jerusalem? Matthew chapter 28, Jesus commissions his disciples. And he says, go out into all the nations and preach the good news, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus ministered in the first century, the house of the Lord was established. The kingdom of God was established. And Jesus sent his disciples into all the earth proclaiming the good news. And so the message is this. When the church is at its best, when the church is 
holy and when the church is seeking the Lord, when the church is generally proclaiming the good news of Jesus, it creates change, not only locally, but it creates change globally throughout all of the world to the extent that if the church is really the church and if the church truly acts as the people of God, that the nations themselves will beat their weapons of war into the ground and study war no more. The church is not the secondary community of change. Now listen to that. The church is not the secondary community of change. Change is not primarily coming about through the government. Change is not primarily coming about through social action. Change is not primarily coming about through our election system. Change is not primarily coming around about through how the nations are moving and how the nations are developing. Change that the world longs to see and change that is real and change that is lasting comes about through the ministry of the church who is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the church, you and I, we are not the secondary means of change. We are the primary means of change in the world around us. And so Isaiah gives us this beautiful picture of what it means to be a part of the fellowship of God. And this morning we're going to talk about the mission of the local church. We've been talking about what we should believe. We've discussed what we should believe about salvation, what we should believe about God, what we should believe about the Holy Spirit. Next Sunday morning I'm going to talk about what we should believe about the end times or the second coming of Christ. And so if you're, interested in, in, if you're interested in that topic, you should come next Sunday. If you're not interested in that topic, you should still come next Sunday, and you should act like you are. But uh, this is what we believe about the church, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe the church is the global fellowship of Christ. The church exists to worship God and do His will on earth. As the redeemed humanity, the church has been commissioned by Christ to make disciples of all nations. All believers are important in the body of Christ, and we are to be nurtured and equipped for ministry, being declared righteous through Christ. Believers are compelled to abide in Christ and walk by the Spirit daily to progressively mature in holiness until, we, uh, until the sure and certain day of final glory in the full consummated kingdom of God. As we anticipate the return of Christ, the church shall be the salt of the earth, bearing witness to the world of the inaugurated kingdom of God. Now, those words are words that I wrote probably a decade or so ago when I was formulating my understanding of different beliefs regarding Christian uh, doctrine and Christian teaching. But the idea is this, that we are the global fellowship of Christ. We are the people of God carrying out the ministry of God in the world. And you see, this is a grand picture. The church is salt. The church is light. The church spreads the message of Christ until the world's end. The church inaugurates the new humanity that's going to be consummated at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so, as we talk about the church, there's this primary question. Are you dedicated to the local church? Are you a part of the body of Christ? Are you a part of the local expression of the believers? Now, there is the church universal which is the church everywhere, every uh, place, every uh, church that proclaims Christ. That is the church universal. And then there is the church local, which this is a local church. This is a local body of believers to have a confession of faith in Christ Jesus. And, but through the local church, the church universal, there's a large-scale vision. And this large-scale vision is to wholeheartedly and enthusiastically dedicate ourselves to what God has called us to accomplish here in this world. And you often hear a common objection. Some people will say, well, I'm committed to Jesus, but I'm not committed to the church. Well, I want to follow Jesus, but I really don't need to uh, be a part of a local body of believers to follow Jesus. Now, let's think about this for one moment. Jesus commissioned the church. The church is the means or the conduit by which Jesus carries out his commission in the world around us. And so we are the body of believers. We are the hands and the arms. We are the group of people who are carrying out the mission of Jesus in the world. So can you generally be a follower of Christ and not be, to some degree, dedicated to a local body of believers? Well, you say, yeah, I can be under the lordship of Christ. 
and I can worship Christ without being dedicated to the local body of believers. Now, if being a part of, un, or if being under the lordship of Christ means that you are carrying out his will in the world, and carrying out his will in the world takes place through partnering with a group of believers, which is the expression of his will in the world, if it takes place in that regard, then can you genuinely be submitted to the lordship of Christ without being a part of the local body of believers or the church of God? And there's a real question there. It doesn't mean that you have to be a part of this church. It doesn't mean that you have to be a part of any specific other church. But what it does mean is that in order to carry out the mission of God, in order to generally be under the authority of Christ, in order to fall under the will of God and be under the lordship of Christ, what it does mean is that you have to be committed. You must be committed to the body of believers, which is the church. You must carry out His will through the local expression of the church as well. So you wholeheartedly, enthusiastically, you dedicate yourself to the local church. Some people say, well, I don't need that. You know, uh, it's kind of interesting what we think that we need and what we think that we don't need. You say, I I don't need that. You know, uh, church doesn't really do anything for me. Some people might say that as well. I don't really get that much from church. And you've heard numerous illustrations of this before. Someone says, You know, uh, no one says this, actually. No one ever says, I don't really get anything from food, do they? (laughs) I mean, we, uh, do you get something from food? You probably do. Uh, I don't really get anything from food. Yet, You know, the Bible says that the teaching of his word is like food. It's it's the bread of life. Well, do you get anything from the bread of life? Do you get anything from the, the word of God? It's like food for your soul. Well, I don't really get anything from taking a shower. Now, I don't know if you do, but everybody else around you does. You know, uh, I don't really get any benefit from taking a a shower. And the Bible says that we are washed. We are sprinkled by the Word of God. Uh, We are made whole. We are made clean by the Word of God. It's kind of interesting what makes us determine the things that are beneficial to us, isn't it? I mean, we determine that bread is beneficial to us. We can determine, I believe, that hygiene is beneficial to us. We can determine to some degree that... uh, that the, the, you know, the air that we breathe and, uh, is beneficial to us. And so what, how do we determine that? You know, uh, some people think that the most benefic- beneficial thing to them you know, uh, is sports and entertainment. And because that's amusing, because it's something that they follow, and, and, and it's something that they like. And so they evaluate church life, and they evaluate church culture. They say, I didn't really get anything from it because I wasn't sufficiently entertained by it. I didn't uh, I, I benefit from go, maybe going to see a movie. I don't benefit from the church. I wasn't sufficiently entertained by it. Now, at its core and at its base, this is not supposed to be entertainment at all. I mean, we are worshiping the living and the true God. And by entertainment, what you're saying is that you're getting some sort of experience from something. I didn't experience anything with it. If you're here this morning and you don't experience anything by singing songs of praise to God, if you don't experience anything by hearing the word of God, that experience doesn't rest upon the fact of the preacher. It doesn't rest upon the fact of the music. It rests upon you as a person because you as an individual are not experiencing what God has to offer through the power of his word and through the direct presence of his holy spirit working in your life and working in your heart so did you experience anything from it well it's between you and god what you experience from it or what you what you gain from all of this as well and again this isn't just what we experience as believers it's also what we accomplish as a body of believers and other people may say well i don't get anything from this you know i didn't get anything from the sermon this morning well, you got this. You got me saying that you didn't get anything from it. That's something, isn't it? You know, if, if you think about it directly. But I didn't get anything from the, the message the, this morning. I, I didn't get anything from the Word of God. And again, this is you. It, it's your direct relationship with God. Your relationship with God does not depend upon this church. Your relationship with God does not depend upon how great our worship team performs. 
Your relationship with God does not depend upon how great or not great this message is. Your relationship with God depends upon how willing you are to allow your heart to worship God and allow your heart to love God as well. And so you wholeheartedly, enthusiastically dedicate yourself to the local church. And we begin, as we talk about the local church, two major ideas. First, we're going to talk about the large-scale mission And secondly, the local expression or membership of that mission. But here we go, the large-scale mission of the church. Matthew 28. Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Now, that passage we just read, Matthew 28, is the fulfillment of Isaiah 2. Or it's the beginning of the fulfillment. Now, it's not the completion of the fulfillment, because the beginning is this. The word of the Lord goes out from Jerusalem. Well, Jesus commissioned his disciples. We are his disciples. We've inherited that promise. It says it spreads into all the world. And then at some point, the nations become Christianized. Or the nations, they beat their swords into the ground. The nations learn about Christ. The nations begin to trust Christ and and to seek Christ as well. And so here is a promise of the progressive, unfolding hope that we have in the good news of Jesus Christ. That it's going to succeed. You know, you look at the world around you and you think, the world looks really bleak and the world looks really bad. Is Christianity going to succeed, or is Christianity not going to succeed? Are we going to fulfill the mission of Jesus? In Isaiah 2, the promise is this. You have all of the authority of God. That's pretty strong, isn't it? You have all of the authority of God to carry out his mission in the world. You have all the promises of God working in you. We as a church body, we have all of the authority and all the promises of God to fulfill his mission in this community and be a part of fulfilling his mission around the world as well. Sometimes we look around and we say, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? You know, uh, if, if, if we have more people come, where are you going to park them? If we have uh, more people come, what are we going to do? How are we going to seek uh, to grow? How are we going to continue as a body of believers? You know, uh, even if we don't have a good solution about any of that, the idea is that we have all authority through Christ, to accomplish his will, and if we are a part of his body, he'll keep it going without us trying very hard. You get that? It's his Holy Spirit working in our hearts. It's his Holy Spirit working in our lives, and our mission, and his mission uh, being accomplished through us. One of the the first church I ever pastored was in Kentucky, and uh, on the way to that church, it was a very small church, and on the way uh, to that church, um, there was another church, which is a very large facility that I've passed, and I probably shared this story with some of you before, but I would drive by this uh, church very often, very large facility. At one point, it had been a great body of believers. It had been a, a tremendous church in the community, but every time I drove by uh, on Sunday, I noticed uh, it because outside on the side of that church building, there was a painting or a words that had been painted on that church that said fresh fish for sale i've mentioned this before it said fresh fish for sale and it wasn't a church anymore it was a a local market that sold fresh fish because there wasn't a church that met there now this wasn't a situation where the the church outgrew the building and, and they went and they found them another building and they sold that building to the fish store this was a situation where the people who were called to be fishers of men couldn't do it anymore, and so they sold it to a place that actually sold some fish. And, uh, and so it had fresh fish for sale. At some point, though, there was a decision that was made. And the decision is, we're no longer going to be the body of believers. We're giving up on the mission. Uh, we can't do this any longer. And the only time a church will fail to accomplish the mission of God It's when they choose to. I hope you realize it. It's when they choose to. Sometimes we think, well, the church doesn't grow because we don't have the right type of music. Some people say that. We don't have the right music. And so people argue, are you going to have contemporary music? Are you going to have traditional music? We don't have the right kind of music. The church isn't going to grow. We don't have the right type of preaching. Uh, The church isn't going to grow because we don't have the right type of preaching. 
or the church isn't going to grow because we don't have the right strategy in place. The church isn't going to grow because we're absolutely disorganized. The church isn't going to grow if we don't share Jesus, period. You get that? The church will grow if we share Jesus. The church will grow if we invite people to come to be a part of his fellowship. The church will grow if we have a mission to follow and to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. The church won't grow if we're internally focused and we're just focused on what we want and what we like and uh, how we can make ourselves happy. And of course, as a body of believers, as a church, I know that you're not like that. And so we have all of the authority of God working behind us to see this ministry prosper. This large-scale mission, it's being a light to the nations. Matthew 5, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand that gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your God in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. The Greek word used here for you is a second person plural. You know, I've said this before. There's no second person plural in English that we use. Now think about that for a moment. What's the second person plural in English? It's you all, right? You know, uh, that's it. That's why people say you all, because they want a second person plural, and we don't use a second person plural. And so Matthew is saying, you all are the salt of the earth. You all are the light of the world. All of you as a body of believers, you're accomplishing his will. And you never underestimate the influence of the local church. Never underestimate our influence as a body of of believers. We have the ability to change the world around us. We have the ability to affect change in this community. It doesn't take a lot of people to create a lot of great influence in the world. It only takes one or two. Now, you know what real leadership is? Real leadership is using your influence for God's glory. You know what bad leadership is? Bad leadership is when you use your influence for your own glory or your own desires or your own motives or your own goals. And you have the ability to influence others around you as a body of believers. You know, uh, two or three of us, we have all of the influence in the world. Now, you just think for one moment how important influence is. Universally, we want to influence people to be a part of the body of believers. Regardless if they attend this facility or not, regardless if they're here or not, we still want to people, uh, see people come to know Christ. If somebody comes to know Jesus and they go somewhere else, that's fine. And they go somewhere else. But if, if some, you should invite them here, you know, I don't think that you shouldn't. You should invite them to be a part of our fellowship. But the idea is we want the body of believers to grow as the universal church. We also want it to grow as a local body of believers, as we see people here come to know Christ as Savior. And that begins with one or two or three people uh, catching uh, the, the, the fire that the Lord has given. I said, it only takes a couple of people to influence an entire church. It just, it just takes a, a few people who are generally feel called to the mission that God has given us to make a big difference in the world around us. Two or three people. I read a statistic. This is very interesting. I think uh, uh, some, uh, some of us were talking about this one day as well. When you Think about a church body, an influence in a church body. This is why I said that it can be negative or a positive influence. It doesn't matter if a church has three or four or five or six hundred people. Um, and you see this happen in churches as well. If, if someone doesn't like a pastor, this is how influence works in a church. If someone doesn't like a pastor, it takes about three to seven people, listen to this, to get rid of a pastor. Three to seven people can get rid of a pastor. Because three to seven people can have enough influence with enough other individuals to gain momentum to create any type of environment they want. Now, that's not you, and I know it's not you. I'm not saying that because of you. I'm saying that because influence is so crucial and so critical for the body of believers. What that means as well is that two or three or seven of you can influence the rest of the congregation in such a way that we carry out the mission that God has given to all of us. 
You see how influence works? It can work in a very positive way. It can work in a, a very negative way. And don't think that when you're not positive and, and when you're not uh, 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 focusing on the mission of God, don't think that people don't notice. I mean, that's why as a body of believers, we always need to be uh, gun ho about what God has called us to do because every single one of us has the ability to influence other individuals, however small that is or however great that is. It doesn't matter. You know, uh, one of the first churches I ever preached in was a church that had about 15 people. 15 people. Isn't that a wonderful church? Uh, 15 people. The first church I ever pastored, we started with we started with 20 people, and we grew to have 80 people. That's pretty good growth, isn't it? You know, we grew we, uh, to have 80 individuals. But this church had 15 people. It was in a different state. I, I think about a, a preaching in that church with 15 people in a different state. Now, that pastor who allowed me to preach, he has now gone to be with the Lord, and he, uh, he was dedicated to that church. He preached at that church. And somebody may look at that and say, well, what kind of influence did he have? with 15 people. Well, that influence carries on, doesn't it? I mean, I've lived in several different states. I've preached to, uh, to, to uh, 1,500 or so people. I've preached to 20 people. And that influence has carried on. You have one individual who influenced me, who through me is now influencing other individuals as well. And it's the same. There are going to be people who go out from this church. I'm sure the Lord is going to raise up some ministers within this church as well, some individuals who may go on the mission field, some individuals who may be called in the ministry, and God is going to continue that influence. And so if you ever think to yourself, what impact do I have? What influence do I have in the world? It takes one person to influence and to change another individual's heart. Leadership is defined by how your influence changes the world around you. And I'm calling you to be a person who has the right type of influence, who cares about the mission that God has called you to accomplish in the world around you. So there is the universal church, there is this grand, large-scale mission, and then there is the local membership, there is the body of believers that are, are gathered here. Ephesians 1, Paul says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It says the church is uh, the saints who are in Ephesus. In Philippians, it says the church that is in Philippi. The book of Revelation says John to the seven churches that are in Asia. And so these local churches were scattered out all across the first century. You notice how Paul and John, they both identify local communities of faith within a given city. And these local communities of faith are carrying out the mission of God. In the same way, God has given us a mission. God is, is calling us to, to carry out His will in the world around us. And this mission takes place through the membership and through the people of God who are gathered here today as we give back to the kingdom of God, as we give back uh, to the glory of God as well. You know, this is a, a very interesting thing. You know, we're uh, not even, uh, you know, a few years old now as a body of believers. You know what we started with? We started with very little. And we found some friends who had a little bit more, right? And then that continued as the Lord worked through it and as the Lord worked through the ministry. But if you look around, you know, the lights you're sitting under, the chairs you're sitting on, the equipment that we use, the, the podium that I'm preaching from, the microphones and, you know, the floor and everything you see around us, these are things that were brought about, of course, by the will of God, that were brought about by the funds that we contributed to the church as well. But we started with nothing and God made something from nothing the first time i ever talked about any of this was god making something from nothing it was nothing now it's something and it's something because god wanted it to be something and it's something because of the mission and the will of god god forms a local body of believers and god hasn't stopped the body of believers that he has formed philippians says he who began a good work in you is going to carry it out until the day of christ jesus that's talking about you as an individual God started something in you. God is continuing that in you. God is going to carry it out. That's talking about us as a church body as well. God started something in us. God is continuing something in us. And God is going to complete it. God is going to carry it out. God is going to work out His will among us. And this begins as we as a body of believers become a part of what God is, is doing in this community of faith. 
in this uh, body of believers. Now, you think to yourself, and you ask yourself, is how are you contributing to what God is doing? You know, in a church body, there are all types of untapped talents. There are individuals who can do all sorts of things. You know, uh, stuff that we don't even know about. And some of you, you're using your gifts. Those of you who are using your gifts for children's ministry. We, we applaud you for that. We, we thank you for that. We need that type of ministry. And you should continue to do that. And there are other individuals as well who should be using their gifts in children's ministry. Now, there are some of you who shouldn't be using your gifts at all in children's ministry because they're not gifts and you make them cry. And that's not a good thing. You know, uh, some of you can sing. And you should be using your gifts in singing to the choir that we have practice on Wednesday or to the praise team, whatever it may be. And you're not using your gifts. And God has called you to use your gifts in the singing. Some of you should be using your gifts in teaching or your gifts in evangelism or your gifts in missions or your gifts in service or whatever it may be. God has called us to be a part of this body of believers. And the body of believers that's gathered here, the success that we experience as a church body it depends on your willingness to contribute. It depends upon your dedication. I would encourage all of you, don't be dedicated to attend church and to be a part of this body once every couple of months. You know, uh, be dedicated to be here, if you can, every Sunday and be a part of what's going on. You know, I, I think no one wants to be a part of something that's just kind of okay. I get that. That's why some people probably, they dug it, that... That's okay preaching. I don't want to be a part of that. You know, that's okay whatever. I don't want to be a part of it. Nobody wants to be a part of something that's just okay. Everyone who, of course, loves God wants to be a part of something that's really life-changing. And it's significant to the kingdom of God. And it's life-changing and significant as all of you believe it's life-changing and significant. We know that it is. We know that this is the will of God. We know that being here is what God wants us to do. We know that He wants us to be dedicated to His mission in the world around us. We know that He wants us to use our influence to accomplish His mission. We know all of those things. But are we dedicated? Are we committed to the large-scale mission of the church? Are we committed uh, to the local body of believers? Are we committed to, or are we committed to actually change the world around us to see a difference? Well, I don't like what's going on in the world right now. Well, do something. Make it different. Change it in a, good, in a positive way. In his book, When a Nation Forgets God, I'm going to end with this story. Owen Lutzer, who's a pastor of Moody Bible Church, retells one Christian story of living in Hitler's Germany. The man wrote this. I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because what could anyone do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance and the wheels coming over the track. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized that it was carrying Jews like cattle in the cars. <clears throat> week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to a death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming, and when we heard the whistle blow, we would begin singing hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the screams, we sing more loudly, and soon we heard them no more. Years have passed. No one talks about it anymore, but I still hear that train whistle in my sleep. God forgive me, forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians, yet did nothing to intervene. Now that's a picture of the church, isn't it, sometimes? We're singing our songs, we're listening to our music, 
We're turning it up louder and louder and louder. But s why? So we don't have to hear the cries that are actually going on in the world around us. And while other people are on the train ride or on the march leading to death, leading to separation from God, turning from God from light to darkness, we just keep cranking up the noise, singing louder and louder, thinking to our, ourselves, if we don't have to hear it, we don't have to look at it, then it must not be real. And so church becomes an insulated reality where we come into a sheltered culture that attempts to escape the world around us so we don't have to deal with life and deal with all of the evil that we see on the outside. And Isaiah 2 says, this is the picture. You are the body of believers. You are the people of God. The world is filled with war, death, pain, suffering, starvation, and evil. And you are called to hear those cries and to make a difference. Would you stand with me?